Hello and welcome to this dramatic reading of Croc, Legend of the Gobbos. Who were the Gobbos? Examine ancient paintings from the time of their civilization, and you will find that the Gobbos were a short, furry people who could be politely described as gerbilesque. But what of their soul? Their character? One historian wrote that the Gobbos were among the most advanced civilizations of their day, making great strides in science and literature. A people whose intelligence shines like a beacon in the night. It should be noted that this historian was himself a Gobbo, and not only made numerous grammatical errors in his account, but also misspelt Gobbo. No, the Gobbos were a simple people, a race whose greatest inventions were edible deodorant and the wind-powered cow moistener. In over 2,000 years of existence, the Gobbos only sent three of their kind to college, and two of those were returned postage due. Okay, so they weren't the sharpest pins in the cushion, but were they lovable? You bet. So lovable that they would often keep each other as pets. But oddly enough, it was their very lovability, their very kind-hearted innocence, that set in motion a chain of events that would send the Gobbos plummeting towards a terrifying fate. A fate worse than death. A fate so frightening that those with heart conditions may wish to stop watching now. Although it's really not that frightening. It all started one morning in the third month of the year of the soup spoon. At the start of each year, the Gobbo High Priestess would announce the kitchen utensil that when put down their pants would bring good luck. Gobbos took this very seriously, although some began to question the practice during the year of the electric can opener. King Rufus the Intolerance, ruler of the Gobbos, was down by the riverbank watching the sunrise. People far and wide had heard of King Rufus the Intolerance and feared him for his name alone. Of course, the Gobbos knew his full name was King Rufus the Lactose Intolerance and only really feared him after a big bowl of cottage cheese. He had just finished breathing a sigh of relief that once again the sun had returned, when suddenly a small basket floated ashore. He and a group of his gobbo subjects huddled around it. Peering inside, they saw a baby crocodile. Naturally, they assumed he must be the early leader in the annual small crocodile basket race. Not that there had ever been such an event, but you never know about these things. And many of the gobbos placed bets just to be on the safe side. After a couple of hours, when no other baskets had come by, the Gobbos decided that perhaps there was no race, or that it had been called off the night before by crocodiles who shared their concern that the sun had gone away for good. The Gobbos were at first wary of the little reptile, but were very quickly won over by his vulnerability and inquisitive nature. King Rufus decided that the Gobbos would raise the crocodile as one of their own, and that he himself would care for it and instruct it in all the ways of the Gobbos. The Gobbos fell in love with their new charge. As he was a crocodile, they began to call him Crocodile. But then someone thought of a clever new name for him, Croc. Although to some of the Gobbos, he will always be known as Mr. Fun Socks or Choo Choo Mabugi. Croc learned quickly from his Gobbo friends. He surprised them with just how Gobbo-like he was. He could sing their anthem backwards and forwards, and won every Gobbo dance contest he entered. In fact, little Croc was so Gobbo-like that it had never occurred to him to take a single bite out of a Gobbo. As far as he was concerned, he was a Gobbo, and thus, a time of great joy reigned in Gobbo Valley. Croc was healthy, King Rufus was happy, and his subjects hadn't had so much fun since the year of the three minute egg timer. Then Croc grew. In one fantastic growth spurt, Croc grew as tall as three Gobbos stacked on top of each other. He started eating like crazy. For breakfast, he ate over 150 buckets of peas. While walking, he would accidentally smash through buildings and trip over homes. A simple game of patty cake with friends would lead to multiple concussions and internal bleeding. Despite his friend's efforts to brush off these accidents, Croc began to feel out of place in Gobbo Valley. Just as Croc decided to do something about this, a Gobbo ran past screaming, Dantinis! The Gobbos had long told stories of the Dantinis, abandoned villains known far and wide for their ruthless burning, wanton looting, and marvellous singing voices. The Dantini Glee Club would have won all the big choral contests had they not been disqualified for eating the judges. What was worse? was that wherever there were Dantinis, Baron Dante could not be far behind. King of all villains, Baron Dante was stronger than a thousand Dantinis, and he had a long-established hatred for all things Gobbo. He had seen the Gobbos and Croc being blissfully happy, and decided that enough was enough. It was time for the Gobbos to suffer. The valley swarmed with Dantinis as they captured Gobbo after Gobbo, and threw them into cages. Dante watched it all, laughing his horrible laugh. King Rufus knew he had to save Croc. He tail-swiped the gong in the centre of their village, and it rang, summoning Beanie the bird. She appeared immediately, and King Rufus instructed her to whisk Croc away to safety. Rufus looked at Croc, 
you're our only hope. Before he could say anything, Beanie spirited Croc away in a shower of magical sparkles, just as Baron Dante snatched up the king in his iron hand. Baron Dante had taken over the Gobbo Valley. He used his magical powers through the land, turning good creatures to evil. Ladybirds, ducks, lizards, fish, and mountain goats all became horrific monsters under his command. Baron Dante stashed Gobbos under Dante new guard throughout his new kingdom, so that if he needed someone to taunt or even bring to tears, a cute little Gobbo would always be nearby. The Gobbos, meantime, being a highly social group, were distraught at being separated from each other. Baron Dante kept King Rufus as a personal pet, locked in a cage at the back of his castle. Rufus was taunted day and night by Dantinis. He consoled himself in these dreadful hours that at least Croc was out of the Baron's reach. Meanwhile, Croc and Beanie the Bird watched as their homeland was turned into Dante's playground. Beanie told Croc that he must act, but Croc was confused. What could he do against the might of Baron Dante? Beanie grabbed him by the straps of his backpack and shook him with all her little bird strength. You're the only chance they have. You must help. Can you imagine what it's like for a gobbo being all alone? Croc sniffed. He could very easily imagine what it was like. And he felt more alone than he ever had before. Straining himself up, he said to Beanie, All right, but I'm going to need your help. Here the legend becomes fuzzy. Historians are unsure as to whether Croc was actually successful in saving his friends. But one thing is for certain. From that point on, he became the greatest champion the gobbos had ever known.